Hi friends, this is Trish and welcome to Happy Holy Healthy Life. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a really important topic and you know how I know it's important? I've tried to film this video like nine times and <laughs> I keep messing up so I'm going to push through, I'm going to persevere, okay? Because I think that this topic is so incredibly important that it can impact every aspect of your life and you'll see why as we talk a little bit more about this. So I want to give you a question and have you answer it honestly in your heart. I want to ask you, is Jesus your first love? Another way of thinking about this is, do you love Jesus more than any person in the world? Do you love Jesus more than anything in the world? And if you're anything like me, um, that's a scary question. It can feel um, a little bit invasive and a little bit like huh, being called out. But the purpose of this video is not to be condemning or to shame you. It's actually to encourage you and to give you an invitation. And I am taking the same invitation that I'm giving out. So let's go ahead and dive into today's topic. Now, what got me thinking about this is I have been studying the book of Revelation lately and I was rereading it. And in chapter two, this really stood out to me this time. There is a church in Ephesus and Jesus basically is giving a report card to each of these churches. He's telling them the things that they've done well and the things that they need to work on. Now, listen to the characteristics of this church. I think that they sound pretty impressive, okay? <laughs> he says, Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So that's a little snapshot of the Church of Ephesus. They're hardworking people. They've endured suffering and persecution. They've not grown weary. But yet somehow in all of that, they've lost their love for Jesus. Now, I am a big why person. I like asking the question why, sometimes even when I shouldn't ask the question why. But one question that I would have is, if they're doing all these things that are so good, I mean, they look like Christian rock stars to me, why is it so bad that they've lost their first love for Jesus? Well, I have a lot of answers to that question and I wanna tell you some of the reasons because if you're a practical minded person like me, you kinda of like to know what the reason for things is, okay? So really the, the chapter John 15 stood out to me a lot when I was reading this and it's really cool because anything that God asks us to do, it's for our good. And I know it's so hard to believe that sometimes. Sometimes it seems like God's just being mean or he's taking stuff away. But really, he literally tells us to do things because it's going to be good for us. So listen to some of the things that happen, according to John 15, when you are abiding in God, when you're abiding in his love. All of these amazing things happen, okay? So our love for Jesus is directly tied to our success as Christians and our impact for the kingdom. That's why Jesus tells this church that their lampstand is going to get taken away if they continue to not put Jesus first. A lampstand is like influence, ministry, impact, and that could be in your own household or that could be to the nations. But our success in ministry and in life is directly tied to our relationship with Jesus. So in John 15, Jesus Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. He says that our joy is found in him. He says our prayers are answers when we abide in him. We receive the fruit of the spirit when we're abiding in Jesus. It says that he's going to tell us things as his friends, that a servant, that somebody that's not in direct intimate relationship with him wouldn't know. So if you're looking for a revelation for your life, for other people's life, for the world, all of those things are found in a love relationship with Jesus. Now, I really like word pictures and analogies. So I was kind of thinking, what would this be like for us to imagine? Because in John 15, it talks a lot about vines and branches. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a vineyard in my backyard possibly because I live in a ghetto apartment. But aside from that, not having a vineyard, there are some things that, you know, I think it's kind of like the same idea. So I was using a blender today and the idea came to me 
basically us not abiding in Jesus and not having a love relationship with him is literally like trying to use a blender that's not plugged in. So there are blades and you do have hands. So maybe you could like mash a banana in there and try to like stir in spinach and break apart ice with your own hands. But you're going to get very tired very quickly and your end result is probably going to be a chunky, goopy, gross mess. Whereas if your awesome Blendtec blender is plugged into the wall and high powered, boom, you've got yourself a gorgeous, delicious smoothie, okay? So I know that's a little silly, but think about really in life, how often do we try to do things without Jesus? How often do we go days and days without prayer and without being in the word? And we wonder sometimes why we feel grumpy and discouraged and angry. We wonder why we feel like there's no answers to our prayers. We wonder why it feels like we're not effective in basic daily life. And all of these things end up happening when we're not abiding in Jesus, when we don't have a love relationship with Jesus. Another thing that really stuck out to me as a reminder is Jesus uses the analogy a lot of brides and romance and marriage and that makes some of us uncomfortable and some of us excited um, but the thing is it really makes a lot of sense when you think about our love relationship with Jesus from a marriage and a bridal standpoint so which wife after 50 years would find it romantic to say to her groom you've endured hardships and you've not grown weary great job, husband. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that not make for a very romantic anniversary if all you've done is just you've endured and you haven't grown weary? That's not very romantic. But what if they tell each other that they still love each other as much as they did on the first day, but even more, that they've grown more in love with each other over the past 50 years than ever? That how romantic would it be for the groom to look in his bride's eyes and say, you're more beautiful to me now than on the day that I met you? How romantic would it be for the for the wife to look at her husband and say, um, you're you're just everything to me. You're you're the light in my sky. <laughs> you get the drift. There's a big difference between duty and faithfulness and hard work and commitment, even though that's good. Those are all great things. You want those things in your marriage. But when you have to sacrifice love, romance, passion, that makes kind of for a sad a sad romance and a sad marriage. Well, it's the same thing in our Christian walk with God. Um, and depending upon what church you kind of grew up in, you may not have really ever heard a lot about loving God and how important that is to him. But I know I forget all the time that literally it's the greatest commandment that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. He's really after love. That's what he's looking for. Whereas some of us, if you've got a worker bee mentality like I can tend to have, I think in sometimes in terms of like checklists, like what do I need to do? Am I doing it right? Am I working hard? But Jesus is basically saying it's a love relationship. So if we get off track, which I'm I'm pretty sure every Christian on the face of the planet has gotten off track with our love for Jesus. There are some remedies that we can follow and we can take it right out of Revelations 2. Jesus says to the church for them to consider their ways, how far they've fallen, that they need to repent and think back to where things went wrong. And then they need to do the things that they did at first. Really interesting. So just as a little personal side note, I can definitely say that there's been seasons in my life where I definitely felt more love and joy and passion for Jesus. I remember being in high school and preaching to kids on the bus. I remember actually getting kind of kicked out of class <laughs> in high school in art class because I was like kind of preaching to the class. I know it sounds kind of weird and crazy. Um, and I haven't done anything like that in years. Like I haven't evangelized to a stranger or anything like that in years, but I had just like so much passion. And I remember even as a really young child being like maybe 12 or so, and I would literally sit on the balcony with a journal and pen in hand, and I would pray and hear from God and like journal pages and pages and pages. And I could go on and on, but there's a lot of times where I can really get away from that. And I want to draw it back to the marriage parallel. That can happen a lot in real life romantic relationships. A lot of times things can get in the way. So what are some of the love busters that could stop our love for Jesus? 
I'll tell you, okay? A lot of times hurt and offense shuts our heart down. Now, what do I mean by that? You can go through some really hard trials and maybe you end up staying faithful to God, you don't give up on him, but maybe because you're so hurt and angry, you just don't really wanna worship the way you used to. Maybe you're offended at God, maybe you feel like he broke a promise to you. And I have definitely been in seasons like that and it's super hard. And I think it happens in a really subtle way. It may not be like we necessarily think these words in our head, we don't think, ugh, I don't want to worship, but it ends up happening. So you can check your heart and say, you know, have I grown bitter, offended, or upset at God in any kind of way? Sometimes you can just get in a comfortable rut, just kind of like in our marriage analogy. You know, uh, typically in first love romance, there's pursuit, you're putting on your perfume, you got on your A game, you're really trying to get to know this person. But then sometime when you get in an actual <laughs> marriage, you kind of get comfortable, you're like, yeah, I got that guy or I got that gale. What am I even going to try to, you know, be pursuing or romantic anymore? And that can happen in our relationship with God. We're like, okay, cool. I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. You know, my life is kind of okay. Not, you know, not any reason to continue radically pursuing God. And we can easily fall into that rut. It's easy to become busy or distracted, especially in the 21st century that we live in with Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and TV, Netflix, you know, fill in the blanks. But we can just actually get really distracted where it's not so much that we're consciously not loving Jesus. It's just that there's so many things vying for our attention that we kind of sort of just drift away. Now, sometimes there might be like actual temptation. Maybe there is something in our life that is actively trying to pull our attention or our belief away from Christ. I know that this happens a lot of times to college students or even like just students in general. If you're surrounded by a bunch of non-believers, maybe they're actively attacking your faith or maybe you have family members that are actively coming against what you believe and it's making it kind of difficult for you to kind of just hang on to your relationship with God. And there's just so many things that could stop us. But I think that that's what Jesus means when he says, consider, repent, and do the things you did at first. It's good to know, okay, what is stealing my love for Jesus? So let's talk about what we can specifically do to really fix this because it's no point in knowing that things are going bad if you don't know how to fix it. So I like to keep it really simple. You can remember just three words, basically word as in the Bible, worship, and prayer. Those are super, super foundational. And if you're anything like me, when you get into busy seasons or trials, it's the simple things in life that fall off first. So you can ask yourself, am I in scripture? Do I have some kind of Bible reading plan? And if you don't, I would encourage you to start in the Gospels. A lot of people like starting in the Gospel of John. And I would recommend the show Chosen if you've never seen it before. I think it's really cool that it brings scripture alive. But anywho, find some way to get into the Word. I have been known to read children's Bibles, <laughs> Bible translations. They're all over the internet. You can find one. It just kind of makes things easy and simple. And sometimes if I'm, I don't know, feeling intellectually lazy, I'll just read the Bible in an easier translation that kind of gets me excited and interested again. Then of course there's just worship. I would encourage you to worship just even a little bit every day, whether it's on your commute to work, whether you're just playing worship music while you're doing your chores, whatever the case, find a way to not only listen to worship, but see if you can also get some singing in there too. And then prayer is super important. I think two types of prayers are important. You want to have like a daily established prayer time, which is a little bit more routine. Maybe you go over a specific prayer list. Maybe you have a specific prayer action plan. But what I love and I find really kind of sparks my intimacy with Jesus more is what I have heard called practicing the presence of Jesus. That is where you're just talking to him all day. I find a lot if there's something that's kind of stressing me out a little bit, I might pray to him. If I'm in a difficult conversation with him, just kind of in the back of my mind, I'll be like, Jesus, give me the words. And sometimes Sometimes there's even like silly things. Um, <laughs> I have two little bunny rabbits and I love them so much, but they have been the naughtiest little pets I've ever had in my life. And so just yesterday I asked Jesus for an idea. I was like, Lord, these rabbits are so bad. <laughs> what can I do to kind of train them? And then he gave me some ideas and they seem to be working. <laughs> um, so whether it's something ridiculous, like, you know, making your rabbits behave or something really serious, like, you know, you're maybe 
ministering to somebody and you do not know what to say just those like prayers where you're just talking to him in your mind and heart and there's nothing to me more encouraging than getting an answer like quick from God because not only do you realize that you know he's the God of the universe but you know that he's so close to you and he's intimate with you he really knows everything that's going on in your life and he wants to have that relationship with you so there are so many things that I could say about this topic but I would just encourage you to really take the little bit of no nuggets that you've gotten today before God and ask him where to start. I know that sometimes the topic of loving Jesus can actually be overwhelming and stressful, but it's not meant to be that way. Jesus says, you know, my yoke and my my burden, it's easy and it's light. So meaning when he gives us a command, it's not meant to be this thing that just weighs us down and stresses us out. It's meant to be something that's light and energizing when we're doing it with him. And so one of my pastors says, basically, it takes God to love God. It takes him to know him. So that's also super encouraging because anytime you don't have something spiritually, like you're like, oh no, I don't have faith. Or like, oh no, I don't love Jesus. It's so cool. All we have to do is ask to say, Jesus, give me love for you. Jesus, give me faith. And he wants to do that and he will do that for you. So I don't want to drone on and on in this video, but I hope it encouraged you. And if you have anything you want to tell me, drop it down in the comments. I always read all of the comments and I will see you guys later. Bye for now.